Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God and in your providence you would like us to reflect and to consider this passage this morning. And I pray as we come that each one of us would put aside the busy things of life to reflect, to stop and to hear your word for we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, on most Sundays here at Multicultural Bible Ministry, one of the things that we do early on in the service, which we did this morning, was to have what we call chat time. Chat times where a series of questions, or normally a question, will go up on the screen, just a a friendly way designed to help us engage with the people around about us. You see, there's something about asking a question and then answering a question that reveals something about who we are or how we view a particular topic of interest. So, for example, if I was to ask you, do you call it football or soccer? That would tell me something about you. Do you prefer summer or winter? Do you prefer mild food? Do you prefer spicy food? These are all questions that when we ask and answer, they reveal something about our background, something about what we view or how we view the world. Uh, In icebreakers, in contexts where people want to get to know others, one of the most common questions is this one. If your house was burning down, what three things would you grab before leaving? I don't know if you've ever asked that question, and it's a bit disturbing that this, this question is asked about houses burning down. But I actually got online because this is quite a common question in get to know you context and I discovered looking on the internet there was a certain predictability about what people would want to take with them. Normally it was relational so people would want to take uh, their family. Other people say I'd like to take photo albums. Some people say I'd like to take jewellery or passports. I read one man who said this, he said if my house were burning down I would take three things, kids, dog, wife, in that order. Uh, he, he, said, I don't, he said, I don't need to grab my wife. She can walk. I just need to make sure she's awake. My dog can probably find her own way out too. So can my teenager. I just need to make sure they're aware of the situation. But then he said, if I have time, I might actually grab my car keys and drive my car closer to the house and hope it burns too so then I can get a new one while I'm at it. Now, as I looked at some of the answers about this, it was actually, it's a fun question. People ask about what they they would take, but actually behind the question, there's a larger question, and really it's about what is it that you most value in life? If you're down to three things, what do you most value? It's a serious actual question, but asking the big questions of significance, the big questions of life, and stopping to pause on our purpose, our existence, are actually really helpful things for us to do. And I think there is no greater, more significant question than the one which was asked for us in our Bible reading as a young man came to King Jesus and he asked this question, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? What good thing must I do to get eternal life? If I was to ask you, or Jesus Uh, was to come and ask you today, what good thing must you do to make sure in this life that you are prepared for the next life? What would your answer be? You see, this is a significant question and perhaps the most significant question that you'll be asked not only today, but this year. Knowing where you stand before God, your creator, is not something that we simply ask for a fun conversation. It is a question that you and I must answer. And fortunately for us, when we come to Matthew 19, verses 16 to 30, we are going to see Jesus is going to answer this question. It's going to be somewhat of a surprising answer for us. But this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to ask and answer this question. And as we do, walk through the passage. We're going to get to the end, and I'm going to suggest there are two things that will stop you from entering the kingdom of God. And then lastly, we'll come back and revisit this question, what is it that we must do to inherit eternal life. Well, as I said, when we come to this passage, it continues Matthew's theme of presenting a Messiah, King Jesus, who is a surprise. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, there are lots of surprises along the way. Jesus, for example, will say or surprise us by saying, if you want to be great, it'll be because you are the servant. Jesus elsewhere would say, I come as God's Messiah, but first... I must be killed and then raised again. In this passage, Jesus is going to say, if you want to be first, you must be last. 
These are surprising answers that Jesus will give us right through the gospel. And as we come to this passage and think about who can enter God's kingdom, it comes on the back of a surprising passage. And uh, again, next week, Ben will explore this a bit further for us. But in Matthew chapter 19, just the verses immediately, we get some people welcomed as disciples who you don't expect. Listen to verse 13 and 14. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them and Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, don't hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In the Old Testament and in Judaism, children had some value to the community, but it wasn't until the age of 12 where a boy would have what they call a bar mitzvah, where he would declare, I am a son of the law, or a girl a bat mitzvah, that they were really welcomed into the community. They were always valued, but they were almost deemed as kind of additions to the community, but it's really when they got to the age of 12 or thereabouts, and then they could actually get serious and be part of God's people. Jesus, however... And this is probably, by the way, in the background of the mindset when they bring children and little ones to be blessed by Jesus. And the disciples say, buzz off, tell them to go away. But not Jesus. In fact, Jesus is going to shock us by saying the kingdom of God belongs to these sorts. People who humbly, childlike faith will trust in him. So we have this surprising disciples welcomed But then we get the sort of person that we expect to be a disciple turn up in verses 16 to 30. It says this in verse 16, Just then a man came up to Jesus. Now in contrast to the children who we don't expect to be the disciples, this is the exact sort of guy we want as a disciple. We expect to be a disciple. From the context, there's at least four things that stand out about this guy. Uh, First of all, he's young, so he's got a lot of enthusiasm. Mentioned a couple of times that he's young in verses 20 and 22. We also discover that he's a moral man as the passage unfolds. He keeps the law. He obeys his parents. There are certain things that he does not do because he's morally upright. He's an earnest man. He comes passionately to Jesus. In fact, other gospels will talk about the manner in which he approaches Jesus. But then we also discover in verse 22 that he was very wealthy. This young guy had money. In fact, as we look at this guy, we think this guys he's checked a whole bunch of boxes. This is impressive. Mark in Luke's gospel also suggests that he was a ruler. And for that reason, some have suggested maybe he he works at a local synagogue and is a religious leader. But we also discover in Mark chapter 10 that when he comes to Jesus, he falls on his knees, a sign of humility. Here is a young, moral, earnest, wealthy guy who we think this guy is the sort of person that we want on the team. Listen to what he says to Jesus. He says this, he asks this significant question, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? He asks the key question. A good man asking the right question to the right man. He's come to the right place for answers and he's asking the right question, the question that each one of us needs to ask and answer this morning. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, talk about an open door for evangelism, right? An open door for the good news. At this point, Jesus should say, I'm glad you've asked Come join the team. I'm going to pray with you right now. Before you know it, we'll get you on a roster. You'll be part of our community. This is going to be fantastic. But surprising Jesus doesn't do that. He digs a little deeper. He asks the question in verse 17. Why do you ask me about what is good? He doesn't give the answer that we expect. But rather he says, why are you asking me about the issues of goodness? You should know the implication. You should know about goodness. What does the Bible teach about goodness? What does it teach about how we might have life? And so Jesus reminds him, and here is an allusion to two very important Old Testament passages. He says, there is only one who is good, probably a reference to Deuteronomy 6.4. He says, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. He's saying, you're asking me a good question or the question about goodness. You actually know the answer. 
What does the Bible teach? What well, says that there is a God who is good, and if you live according to his commandments and keep his commandments, you'll inherit eternal life. That's an allusion to Leviticus 8, 8 uh, rather 18 verse 5, where it says, Keep my decrees and my laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. Jesus says, you know what the Bible says about goodness and inheriting eternal life? Keep the law. Now, Jesus knows he's setting him up here because Jesus will reveal that no one can keep the law perfectly. And so the guy, I think probably genuinely, asks this question, which ones? Which laws? You see, if you were to go back to the Old Testament books, particularly uh, books like Exodus and the books of Leviticus, you would describe discover that when Moses gave the law, there are 613 commandments given in the Old Testament. In fact, were you to see a traditional Jewish prayer shawl, you would see that hanging down, there are 613 strands of, of wool. Why? Representing each of the commandments given by Moses. And so this guy asks a legitimate question. Okay, when it comes to the law, which one? We know that there, of the 613 commandments, there were 10 that we often highlight as the Ten Commandments, which were written on stone. And ultimately, they can be siphoned down to two most important ones, love God and love your neighbor. But here, Jesus responds to this man when he says, which commands am I to keep? And Jesus gives this response. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. Here Jesus gives six uh, commandments, six to nine out of the Ten Commandments. He doesn't actually start with love the Lord your God with all your heart. He doesn't talk about uh, replacing God with idols. He gives here the, the commands of six to nine, and then he throws in the last one, love your neighbor as yourself, which we often call the golden rule. This kind of highlights all of these other commands are all sort of summarized in this golden rule. So Jesus says, these are the commands you had to keep if you want to inherit eternal life, if you want to be right before God. Now, here's the astonishing response of this man. Listen to what he says. He says, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Now, this is really self-confident. This guy is really self-assured. He has lived, at least externally, keeping these rules. Yet, even in keeping all of these rules... He still asks that question, what do I lack? He realizes, even though he's trying his best, he still doesn't have assurance. And maybe that's the reason he's actually come to Jesus, because he's looking, Jesus, I, I still don't feel right. There's got to be something I'm missing. Tell me what to do. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, that is to say complete, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This was one of the commands out of the Ten Commandments Jesus left out and intentionally left it out because Jesus knew that this was actually the man's heart problem. His problem was coveting. He wanted things. He thought that things, whether his things or the things of a neighbor, would actually make him happy. The ideal candidate he asks the right question to the right man, but instead of a good response, we get a bad response. We get a sad response. Verse 22, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. When Jesus called him to be a follower, the man ultimately had to weigh up in his heart what was most important to him. He had to ask that question and it was, a not, it was a multiple choice question, but there was only two choices. Do I follow Jesus or do I continue to hold on to my wealth? Jesus made it clear you can't have allegiance to both. In fact, Jesus earlier in his teaching says this in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Here we have this potential disciple who checks all the boxes, and yet ultimately when he weighs up what he wants, does he want eternal life by trusting in Jesus' word, 
Or does he want his wealth? Sadly, he leaves and goes after the wealth. Listen to what, this would have been shocking, by the way, for the disciples. I'm sure they're thinking to themselves, Jesus, you've just chased away this guy. He could add so much to our team. Jesus said this in verse 23, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, entering his kingdom, entering the kingdom of God, having assurance of eternal life with God after death, acquiring that is actually really hard. Because it requires of you making a decision to trust in Jesus rather than holding on to your own wisdom. To this man here, his his issue is money. We hold on to all sorts of things. For some of us, it might be that we hold on to pride. Jesus calls us to follow him, but we say, actually, we, we, we don't really need to admit that we've got failures. For others, it might be a desire to, I know Jesus calls me to follow him, but I actually want to go after my career or I want to go after this or that. I'm just unwilling to do it. But Jesus explains here for this man, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And this is what we we call hyperbole. Jesus is using an illustration by way of exaggeration. You see, uh, in the ancient world, particularly uh, in the Middle East at that time, the largest animal uh, those times was the camel. Uh, The large animal, and Jesus would use an example here, and it just so happens I've got uh, with me uh, a a little needle. And uh, Jesus would say, it's easier, or it's rather hard, for this camel to go through the eye of a needle. To get through here, is that possible? There's no way it's possible. That's way too big. And what's Jesus' point? He says that's how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, he doesn't say it's impossible, but it's hard. Listen to what his disciples heard when they heard Jesus use this illustration. They're kind of shocked. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? If this guy can't get in, what hope do the rest of us have? Jesus looked at them and he he offers this wisdom. He says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. For somebody to be acceptable to God, it actually requires God doing something. Because it is impossible for us to change our own nature. It is impossible for us to get in the position where our hearts are so changed that they are acceptable to God. It is only when Jesus changes and transforms our heart that we can know with assurance that we have a life that is right with him. Perhaps as a result of this shock, Peter then asked the question, Verse 27, he says, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Jesus says, listen, Peter, disciples, those who trust in me, those who trust in my word, those who trust in my promises, those who come to God the Father through me, they will be honored. They will inherit eternal life, not through their own efforts, but by trusting in me and my goodness, by obeying in faith what they they have done. You see, the, entering the kingdom of God is not about impressiveness. It's not about accomplishments. It's not about externally appearing to have it all together like this young man. To be right before God, being a disciple, is where you actually admit you don't have it together, you need help, you need forgiveness, and that you are going to trust in Jesus to provide all of those things which you cannot provide for yourself. You see, even in the response of the disciples, there's still an element, even within Peter's mind, hey, but Jesus, what have we done? And so Jesus concludes, again, with this teaching that would remind us of the value of humility over pride when Jesus says, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. What's Jesus saying? It's not the impressive guys 
that we put up the front, the ones that check all the boxes that will receive the favor of God. Rather, it is those who have recognized their own inadequacy, who say, God, I need your help. I trust in what Jesus has done for me. So there we have it. We've got this story of a good man asking the right question to the right man, but with a sad conclusion. What are we to do with that? And what are you to do with that this morning as we ask and answer this question? Two things, first of all, I want to observe that will keep us from eternal life before we ask the question, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Two things that will keep you from heaven. Two things that will keep you outside and at a distance and that we would say makes God's heart sad. The first is this. This passage teaches us that trusting in your own goodness will not get you to heaven. Trusting in your own goodness will keep you out of heaven. If you think that on judgment day, you will stand before God and you will say, I've kept this rule, this rule, this rule, this rule, that that will be enough to get you into heaven, this passage would say you are deeply mistaken. You see, it is not your goodness. In this passage, we have a guy who evidently, from all externals, look really impressive. He even said, I've kept all of these things. But when Jesus dug a little deeper, we discovered actually this guy didn't love his neighbor as himself because he actually coveted things. He had an issue with holding onto things and not being open and sharing what God had given him. You see, he was trusting in his own goodness. One of the great myths of the world is that we can get to heaven by doing good things. We think that if we try our best, God will welcome us. We think that if we keep all the commandments or help others, that God will welcome us in. We think if we do more good than bad, we'll be okay. We think as long as I don't kill or hurt someone, then surely God will let me in. Friends, this story, which happened in the life of Jesus, is a reminder that our goodness even if it is, some of it is good, is never going to be good enough to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because we are all broken. No matter how much we try, we can never attain God's standard of perfection. It's like this. One day, uh, maybe somewhere down the road, I would like, there's one, a few places in the world I'd like to go to, but one of them is the Cook Islands. Uh, I would love to go to Rarotonga, all right? And I think many of us would like to go to the Cook Islands. But here's the thing. I did some Google searching And it is 5,000, just under 5,000, 4,970 something kilometers from Sydney to Rarotonga as far as the crow flies. Fantastic. Okay? That is a long distance. Now, if I was truly self dependent and independent, I say, I want to go there, not going to bother with the plane, not going to bother with the canoe, I'm going to make my own way there. Now, I know you can't tell this looking at my physique, I am an astounding athlete. Um, But here's the thing, I'm not much of a swimmer, right? Now, I look around here and there's some pretty impressive folks, but here's the thing, I did some Googling. Do you know what the world record is for swimming? Open water, 250 kilometers. That's a long way. But 250 kilometers is not that impressive if you're trying to swim to Rarotonga. You see, if you start, you go there, that's only a, a, a fraction, it's only a percentage. You start swimming, If the sharks don't get you first, you're going to run out of juice. Now, you might say, Malcolm, I'm an earnest swimmer or I'm an earnest athlete. I've really tried. I'm doing, you know, I'm I'm, I'm, uh, eating this sort of diet. I'm low GI, high GI, no taste, low taste. You know, I'm doing all the right things to get into shape. I'm going to swim. Now, some of you might get one kilometer. Some of you might get two kilometers. There's some impressive folks here. Steve Gibb probably get 10 kilometers. But here's the reality, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, it doesn't matter your intention, it doesn't matter your goodwillness, you are never going to get to Rarotonga. And friends, that's how it is with God. We can be sincere like this man, we can be well-intentioned, but if we are trusting in our own effort, it's like swimming from Sydney to the Cook Islands is simply impossible. Friends, your goodness, trusting your goodness before God will not get you into heaven. But secondly, trusting in idols will never satisfy. This passage reminds us 
the problem this guy had was that he wanted to replace a relationship with God with something else. For him, that was wealth. You see, we, the Bible calls this an idol. We replace God with idols. We think that the happiness that we're looking for, rather than going on God's terms, we come on our own terms. We are actually our hearts manufacture or make up these idols. Listen to what Timothy Keller, a pastor, says about an idol. He says, an idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give, anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would hardly or feel hardly worth living. You see, God calls us to follow him, to release those idols and to trust in Jesus. But the thing that will keep many people out of heaven is that we are unwilling to take that. We want to hold on to our wealth because we think that the house or a retirement will actually bring us happiness. We hold on to our addictions, be they sexual, alcohol, drugs, whatever, because we actually don't want to obey the Lord. We want to find happiness in our careers so we will not take seriously Jesus. And you know what? We go after things, and some of these things might even be good things, but ultimately they will fail to secure for us the best thing eternal life. This passage warns us that trusting idols will never satisfy. So let's return to our key question. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? If re religious devotion and doing good things is not the key, how can we receive eternal life? Here's the answer to this question this morning. It's fairly simple. Trust in Jesus alone as the source of your goodness. Trust in Jesus alone as the source of your goodness. To receive eternal life, to receive the assurance of life right with God, begins with acknowledging you do not have enough. You aren't good enough. But it's about trusting Jesus to provide for your insufficiency. You see, the disciples had heard Jesus' word in this account. They had trusted him. They had put Jesus before all others. They valued his word above everything else. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in his letter, how we might trust in Jesus. Romans chapter 3, he says, God has shown us a way to be made right with God, or right with him rather, without keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and it is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. The Apostle Paul writes, people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Friends, this is the basic message that we sing about every week, that we read about in the scriptures, that we come back to even as followers of the Lord Jesus. Entrance into God's kingdom is not based on my goodness or your goodness. It's based on the goodness of Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. On the cross, Jesus pays the penalty for our sins because we weren't good enough. When we were incomplete, when we failed, Jesus was complete. He was perfect. And he invites you all, all of us, to trust in that as the means of acceptance into God's kingdom. Friends, there will come a day this year, next year, or next decade, when I will die, when you will die. And we won't get to heaven and be asked three questions, what, what did you bring with you? Rather, you'll be asked one question. And that question has to do with how, why, rather, you should enter the kingdom of God. The only answer that will get you there is that I have trusted in Jesus alone as the source of my goodness. Friends, don't trust in your own goodness before God. Don't chase after idols. Jesus calls us in this passage to wholehearted devotion. Trust in Jesus as the source of your goodness and find peace and sing about peace, and live in peace with the certainty of that hope. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder this morning of your kindness to us in sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, and the fact that we can stand with confidence knowing we have a good relationship with you, not based on the good things that we have done, not based on our impressiveness, not based on all of these things, but solely on the fact that your Son is good, that our identity is based on who you say we are, because of what Jesus has done. So help us to live in light of his goodness this week as we trust in you, for we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.